Hi, welcome to Cinti's World uh, number 10. I'm going to teach you what the fractional reserve banking scam is. Okay, and I'm explaining it in very simple terms and the problems that it causes and a potential way to fix what, what it is. So let's start off with an example. Suppose John gets $100,000, let's say he wins the lottery or something like that. So he deposited it in the bank or he's promised by the bank 1% interest yearly. The ads, let's talk about yearly interest because it's just, keep the, I don't want to do compound interest. It's not necessary for this example. So this is the bank's balance sheet here. And I don't know if you can see it from the video up there. But customer John has on record $100,000 in deposit. Okay, but because banks in the U.S., I don't know about other parts, will practice 10% fractional reserve. This is mandated by law. Okay, the bank can use 90% of John's money. The bank has to keep 10% uh, on reserve in case John needs to make a deposit today or within the next few weeks or something like that. I mean, not a deposit, a withdrawal. So the bank has enough money to cover the immediate needs that John may have. Okay, but the bank can use 90%, which is $90,000. So let's say Cindy, who is going to medical school, for, and needs a loan for, let's say, $200,000 to pay for this semester of medical, I don't know, medical school costs. Well, of that $200,000 that Cindy's going to get for a bank loan, 90000 of it is going to come from John's money. Okay, and so, uh, 200, so she's going to get, of her loan, she's going to get, and we're only going to talk about the, the original money from the 100000 so even though Cindy's getting $200,000, 90000 of it is from John's money, from the original deposit. Okay, we're just going to talk about the original deposit. Okay, but now because Cindy is borrowing money, she's going to have to pay the bank back with interest of 10%, let's say. I'm just picking nice round numbers. Okay, so the Cindy then gives the money to the university, who's also a customer for the bank, and the, and the university deposits that $90,000 in the bank. But again, the bank reuses that 90% of the 90000 to offer more loans to other people. Okay, and so it goes on and on and on and on and on. When you finally get all the way down, if you do a spreadsheet, this can go down for like 150 to 300 lines before you finally end up with, with nothing. And so if we look at the bottom lines from the original $100,000 of the actual money the bank was able to generate up to $900,000 in fake loans for which the bank is going to collect 10% on, which is $90,000. Let's say, we're just, again, we're just doing a yearly interest thing for simplicity. Um, but since the $900,000 in loans is deposited in the bank, in other words, those people that, let's say, it was all deposited back in, okay, and it's deposited along with the original 100000 then the bank has to pay 1%, which is only $10,000, on the $1 million in deposits. In other words, the total loan column adds up to nine hundred k, where the total deposit column adds up to one hundred k. am uh, sorry, $1 million, which is $1,000K. And that's all covered by just $100,000 on hand. Because the whole point of fractional reserve bank is, is loaning out more money than the assets you have on hand. It's basically a fraud. So the bank is going to collect $90,000 in interest from the people that have loans per year in interest and only pay $10,000 to the people who have deposits for $80,000 net profit. I mean, well, isn't that great? You can take somebody's $100,000 and earn $80,000 a year from it. I mean, that's fantastic. I'd love to get in on this business. There's a good aspect to this, is this process makes maximum use of what would otherwise be idle money. That's the only good thing I could come up with this whole process. So where's the bad? Well, problem number one, you can have a run on the bank. And what's a run on the bank? Well, if depositors get spooked, they could all come run down to the bank and pull out all their money at the same time. But since the bank owes people $1 million, and since they only have $100,000 in real cash on hand, they can't pay everybody back. This is called a run on the bank, and this will cause the bank to fold. This is one of the problems in the crash of the 1929 uh, Great Depression. And there was a movie called a, uh, It's a Wonderful Life that was made, and here's Jimmy Stewart, who's playing the little saving, a building and loan, and he, all the people are coming and demanding their money back, and he's telling, well, your money is in such and such's farm, and your money is in such and such and this, and he's trying to give them the spiel. This guy's running a fraud. 
but he's painted as the good guy. And he actually has to borrow money from somebody else, a friend of his, to pay the, at least pay these people enough back so that they can be... You know, and, and, but he doesn't pay them back. He only pays them a little bit back. Say, you know, keep your money in the bank. So, and the thing that I love is they portray this guy, this they make him look like a fat cat banker with all kinds. He's evil and they call him all kinds of names. They never mention one bad thing he did. i got to go back and watch the movie. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie. But I don't remember them actually claiming he did anything wrong. They just paint him through inference to make him look like an evil, nasty person. But the point is that his bank is solvent. His bank is bankrupt. So who's the criminal here? I mean, I don't know. I mean, the Hollywood is good at painting up is down and down is up. So the solution that the bankers came up from the Great Depression, because bankers don't want to pay you interest for the use of your money, or real interest rather, so they need to maintain the illusion that you have unfettered access to your money. So what did they do? They went with the federal government, invented the FDIC to establish, a, to establish using your tax money to insure your own deposits. That's great. Your own tax money is being used to protect your deposits. They don't pay, they pay a pittance to the FDIC. Problem number two that arises is defaults. If people who take out the loans can't pay them back, then this is called a loan default. Now normally in a good economy, let's say where the assets that the money was given against were worth something, then the bank could just seize those assets and, and, and usually get more money back than what they loaned out. But in the housing crisis in 2005, 2006, where the values of properties diminished rapidly, this wasn't an issue. And also, if you got a loan, let's say, for a college education, that money's gone. There's nothing they're going to recover. Okay, and if the banks can't get money back, not only to pay interest to their depositors, but to be able to pay off their depositors, well, the bank is going to fold again. And in 2007, the government had to bail out the banks for making faulty loans. Okay, so fractional reserve banking is a fraudulent system which is the cause of the boom and bust cycles which have preceded each of the major wars and depressions. Okay, but there's a way to fix it. Make it honest. Tell depositors that their money is being used. Tell them that they have restrictions on access to their money. Be honest. It's called capital controls. Okay, they'll naturally expect more money to be paid to them for the use of their money. Now that they're totally aware that their money is being used and because it's being used they don't have actual direct access to it. Okay, the only, this is the only way to solve it because you can't expect the government to regulate it because okay, government regulations don't work because regulators can be paid to look the other way. Uh, there's so few regulators to all the bankers making all that money so don't expect regulators to be honest. Okay, but for a more detailed history of fi uh, uh, fractional reserve banking and the history of money and the Federal Reserve. See the Money Masters. It's a 1996 documentary. It's almost four hours long. Uh, if you get the first few minutes, they get a, seem like they get a little bit of conspiracy theory, but sit, sit through the first 22 minutes. It's a very interesting tell, and it really explains a lot where all the scam stuff came from, um, and how all the presidents have been fighting the banks since the beginning of the creation of the United States. Anyway, thank you very much.